Hi, welcome everyone to Brain Matters, which is a series of webinars launched, launched by the Human Brain Project in order to disseminate the uh, scientific achievements of the project and also to promote the eBrains, which is the uh, technic te technological infrastructure developed by the project. Um, in the session today, uh, we will be uh, considering the topic of exploring the mechanisms of consciousness disorders. And for that, we will have uh, Olivia Gosseris and Rajanikat Panda with us, who are members of the Coma uh, Science Group uh, in, in, in the University of Liège. Um, this is me, um, a younger version in the, in the picture. Um, I will be uh, uh, chairing this session. Um, although for the topic today, I'm a bit, little bit of an outsider since I studied uh, theoretical physics at the uh, University of Basque Country. And I am mainly an expert in complex networks and uh, uh, complex uh, dynamics, but uh, especially um, uh, applied to brain connectivity and brain dynamics. Um, so uh, some points for the uh, how the how the uh, uh, how the web webinar works. Uh, there will be three presentations of 10 to 15 minutes. All questions will be addressed at the end of the session. So after the, the presentations, we will read them uh, from the Q&A panel. Uh, please find it at the, at the bottom of the window. Um, please mention the name of the, of the speakers that you are addressing the, the, the question, but feel free to uh, ask questions to all of us but please mention if you want uh, the three of us to answer. And uh, please don't uh, write the, the, the comments on the, the questions on the chat because we will only read them from the Q&A. So um, just to have a bit of uh, an introduction here to the, to the topic of today, um, you know, let's face the hard question, which is, well, okay, what is consciousness, right? This is the million dollar question that everybody seems to want to answer. And indeed, there are tens of answers. And there's many, many theories trying to explain consciousness from very various uh, sources, from biology, from cognitive science, from philosophy, even from computer science now with the onset of artificial intelligence. Um, it is not the time and place to, to review all of those, but there's very excellent reviews out there just two examples here that you can check. Um, one of the reasons I think there is so many ideas about consciousness is that, well, we all have our own idea of what consciousness is, of course. Uh, we all know how it feels to be conscious. We all know how it feels to lose consciousness because every night we fall asleep and for a few hours we are we are gone until we naturally wake up again in the morning. Now, some people will say that that is not enough experience to explain consciousness fully. So there are other ways of enhancing the uh, conscious experience, for example, meditation or through psychedelics. Now, others will also, will also say that, yeah, in order to understand consciousness, you also need to understand how it is lost. Um, yeah, sleep is the natural way, but every day in the, in the hospitals in the world, patients are anesthetized in order to go through surgery. And there is other uh, a scenario, which is actually brain damage. Yeah, there's many, uh, many, many reasons for why uh, brain damage could lead to loss of consciousness. This can be either traumatic brain lesion, this can be stroke, this can be cardiac arrest, or many other. Now, the typical uh, pathway, just very, very roughly and naively, of, uh, of a patient after brain injury is that 
they will fall into coma, which is characterized by uh, having the eyes closed and showing no responses to external stimuli. Um, patients surviving coma, they will uh, follow a path towards recovery. And this path uh, passes through different states. Um, now, it is very challenging in the clinic um, to, to treat uh, patients with disorders of consciousness because one of the things that, uh, that the clinicians need to do is to know at which level, at which state is the patient. And every patient is actually different because usually every brain injury is different. The other challenge is, of course, to understand the why and the how. So why was consciousness lost in first place? Why it is recovered partly or fully? and how it happens. Um, so before we move to uh, the next presentation, um, I would like to make a bit of a statement because um, you know, consciousness is a super, super interesting topic um, sometimes. Um, but yeah, the daily reality in the clinic is very harsh. So. Uh, we all have, everybody in this field, we all have a responsibility to do our best to help the clinicians and the, the clinicians, the patients and the families, of course. And this means that we are responsible for delivering better measured methods, reliable data analysis tools, and of course, a much better mechanistic understanding. And with that, I will pass... Uh, the, the floor to Olivia Gosseris. Uh, please, Olivia, you can now start sharing your screen. Okay. Here okay. We go. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Olivia uh, had a master in psychological and educational science in the University of Brussels. Uh, she did her PhD in biomedical and pharmacology at the University of Liège. Uh, over the years, she has done significant, con significant contributions to the field of consciousness, but especially focused on the diagnosis and the prognosis of patients with disorders of consciousness. Nowadays, uh, she's the co-director co of the Coma Science Group led by Professor Stephen Lauris at the University of Liège. So, Olivia, please, um, it's all yours. Uh, thank you, Gorka, and thank you, uh, HBP, for this webinar. So uh, indeed, I work at the Coma Science Group, and it was founded by the doctor and Professor Lorais. But three years ago, he uh, asked uh, Dr. Thibault and myself to be the co-director of the Coma Science Group. So we are very happy about that. And the main aim of the Coma Science Group is to understand consciousness, but more particularly consciousness disorders. We've been into HBP for over three, four, five, six years now. And so I will present you some of the work we have done. So um, Gorka already showed you uh, what we what we think is a disorders of consciousness after coma. So you can see that there are actually different entities, clinical entities, starting with coma. Um, and this is an acute state, so it only lasts a few hours up to a few weeks, and either the patient will die if the brain lesions are too severe, or will transition into an unresponsive wakefulness syndrome or previously vegetative states if they start opening their eyes. And then they can transition into a minimally conscious state. Uh, and in 2011, we also divided that state into plus MC minimally conscious state plus or minus, depending on the presence or absence of language processing. And then once they recover functional communication or functional use of object, then we said that they recover from the minimally conscious states. So the unresponsive wakefulness syndrome and the minimally conscious states can be permanent or they can be just a phase, a transition into recovery. But what we have observed is that at the bedside, when we see these patients, it's very hard sometimes uh, to distinguish one from the other because it's based on are they conscious or not. 
And as we know, this is very subjective and it can be hard to uh, assess. And so that's why we use uh, brain imaging to infer consciousness through what we can observe in the brain. To do so, we use fMRI and structural MRI. We looked also at the PET scan, looking at the brain metabolism, at the electroencephalography, the EEG, to look at the brain electrical brain response. And sometimes we couple this technique with transcranial magnetic stimulation, and especially in the work that we have been performing in HBP. So on the side, and as Gorka already mentioned, we can study disorders of consciousness, but we can also study other states of consciousness in order to better understand uh, consciousness mechanism. And so in collaboration with um, a lot of different labs, but most specifically within our consciousness, Giga Consciousness Group here at the University of Liège, uh, the SPRG lab and the anesthesia and perioperative ne uh, neuroscience lab. We also study anesthesia, sleep, hypnosis, meditation, trance, and uh, virtual reality. But coming back to uh, disorders of consciousness after coma, uh, during SG1 uh, in HBP, we developed the perturbational complexity index in collaboration with the University of Milan in the University of Wisconsin in um, Madison in the US. And basically, uh, in a nutshell, what we did is to perturb the brain with a, a, stimula a magnetic stimulation. We record the brain activity, and then we compress this uh, brain activity using the Lempel-Ziff complexity, and that gives us a number between zero and one. And what we have observed in um, the first works is that there's a nice correlation between this index of consciousness and the level of consciousness of the patient. So here you can see in gray, for instance, patients who are in unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. So they only show reflex movement, no conscious behavior whatsoever. And we see that the PCI is below uh, 0 0.3. So it's a low PCI, wherever you stimulate on the brain. Uh, whereas in patients in minimally conscious states, patients who recover from the minimally conscious states or patients in locked in syndrome, so that's patients who recover from coma, fully conscious, but they are fully paralyzed. And in all those um, patients, we, you see that the PCI is high, it's above 0.3. So this, this work has been then replicated over over 100 patients and participants. It's very reliable. Uh, but we have seen now on more data that patients who are unresponsive at the bedside, they actually can show three kinds of responses. The first one is a flat response. So you stimulate the brain, nothing happens. And this is often the case when the patient had an anoxia, so a lack of oxygen uh, throughout the whole brain. And then PCI is zero. The second option uh, or what we see most often is the slow, simple wave, stereotype wave that we also see in, anesthesia, in deep anesthesia and in non-REM sleep. And that gives a low PCI. But in some patients who are unresponsive at the bedside, we do see a complex response, as you can see in purple, with a high PCI. So there is a differentiation and more complexity in the brain of those patients. And we have seen that those patients, so, so that means that there is a capacity of conscious, to be conscious, even if we don't see it at the bedside. And those one may recover better in the long term than the patients who have a, a flat response or a simple response. So some of those data, they are uh, shared in eBrain, so I invite you to uh, check that out. Then we went one step further, and this is the work more recent during SG3, uh, again with the collaboration of the University of uh, Milan and the lab of Marcello Massimini and Mario Rosanova, etc., and also the University of Korea. Uh, and we went a step further because the PCI was mostly done uh, with the TMS-EG data, whereas here, as uh, I'll show you later, you, we can both use TMS-EG or only EG without the TMS. 
And the second um, additional thing that we have looked at is here we look at two components of consciousness, arousal and awareness, whereas before we were only looking at awareness. So looking at arousal is if the patient has the eyes open or eyes closed. So with this new explainable consciousness indicator, it's possible to look at both components of consciousness. And so we can differentiate, for instance, someone who's under ketamine with eyes open from someone who is in REM sleep with eyes closed. And yet both of them uh, report a subjective experience afterwards. Um, and so here we see that it works also for patients with disorders of consciousness in sleep and in anesthesia. And then the, uh, another work that we have been doing in HBP is really to move with multimodal assessment because the first one was with TMS EEG, the second one with EEG and TMS EEG. And here I show you some work that we have done with also Raja, uh, who is here, and then uh, our colleague uh, Aurore Thibault and many other people. Um, and we use both PET scan to look at the brain metabolism and EEG. And then we look also at the recovery, if the patients have recovered or not. And this is a very striking um, um, research because we basically show that uh, in unresponsive patients in blue, so we see the patient at the bedside, we assess them with standardized evaluation, and we all agree they are uh, unconscious and responsive at least. Then we looked at their brain activity, and we see that in 67% of the cases, the brain metabolism uh, is actually more compatible with the diagnosis of minimally conscious states. Similar for the EEG, looking at the connection in the, in the brain. And those patients in particular will show a better recovery one year later. As you can see here um, in yellow, you have 22% of those patients who show atypical brain activity who will transition into a minimally conscious state which is not the case if they just show the typical uh, pattern of unresponsive patients where half of them will pass away within the year and half of them will remain in the unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. So some of those data are also shared in eBrains. And then another part of the work that we have been doing uh, is about treatment, because what I've shown you just before, it's really about diagnosis. Is the patient conscious, yes or no, based on what we can observe in the brain? But ultimately, we also want to treat those patients to find a cure to cure coma. And one new avenue of the group, which is also part of HBP, is to test psychedelic uh, as a treatment. And the reason for that is that we have seen that patients with disorders of consciousness show a low complexity um, in the brain. And previous work have shown that uh, participant, healthy participant who take psychedelic, they have an increase of brain complexity in their brain. So if we apply uh, psychedelic in patients with low complexity, we believe that we can um, increase their brain complexity and do their behavior. And so this is an ongoing work with um, our colleague Paolo Cardone, Charlotte Marcel, and many, many other people in collaboration. Uh, and we use ketamine in one of the study and then psilocybin in the others, and we have promising results so far. And uh, in parallel, we can also look at modeling the psychedelic. So here we can use the data that we already have in healthy participants under psychedelic, and then try to apply this using modeling in patients to also simulate and predict the effect of psychedelic in disorders of consciousness. And that's the work mostly of Naji Al-Najar and Yitka uh, Anan in our groups. So... In essence, uh, what I have shown you we and, uh, allows to better understand consciousness, but not yet uh, really the mechanism of consciousness. So the work that Gorka and uh, Raja will show you later will um, dig a bit more into that. But there's a recent paper that was published in Neurocritical Care uh, that suggests that there are actually five steps that needs to be done to better understand the mechanism of consciousness in order to improve even better the diagnosis, the prognosis, and the treatment. 
The first step is to establish a framework. So we all need to talk the same language and to um, discuss the same concept. So if we can uh, all agree on a framework, that would already be a good thing. The second one is to link brand structure and function. Uh, recently, this has been work, uh, ongoing work, but before it was very much uh, research on structure on one side or function on the other side. And now we see that there's a real interest to combine both together. And this is also what is going uh, next in the next uh, talks. Uh, and in HBP, the third step is very important where we can unite macro and micro scales uh, again to really try to um, become more transversal into the study of consciousness. The fourth step is to combine theory and data driven approach. And then the last step is really to integrate everything together. And this is really the perfect um, moment to do that in HPP. And that's what has been doing been going on over the last years. So with that, I thank you very much. And I pass the floor to Raja, but I think Yorka, you may introduce him before. Yes, actually, um, we had a little uh, change in the program, so I will present now the, the talk, and Vaya will, will will give the last slot. Okay. Um, so um, I'll go with my presentation then. So um, I will continue on the grounds uh, explained by Olivia. And I will explain this very recent work we have done in collaboration between the Pompeo Fabra University and the Coma Science Group of, the, of Liege uh, within the framework of the Human Brain Project. Um, our idea in here is to try to characterize better um, how the, how the propagation of activity in the brain is disrupted during uh, disorders of consciousness. Um, so it has been shown, as uh, Audrey already mentioned, that a, both natural stimuli and, uh, and artificial stimuli are disrupted during, uh, during loss of consciousness. So, for example, in this experiment by Ishizawa and Ahmed, uh, they they stimulated mice uh, both tactically through some uh, uh, blows, poofs, uh, and auditorily, and they measured the brain response, the activity in primary sensory cortices and in further away uh, in the so-called association cort uh, cortical regions. And what they found is that um, during anesthesia, for example, or during sleep, um, the primary sensory cortices still react to the input of the stimuli, but somehow, for some reason, that activity does not reach the association cortices. So with, with uh, artificial perturbations, as the case of uh, the perturbational complexity, complexity index that Olivia mentioned, uh, given, a, given a, 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 a TMS, applying TMX, TMS to a brain region during a wakefulness triggers a brain-wide response, right? But during loss of consciousness, so for example, in non-REM sleep, it's in the same uh, feature that the, the, the region of the brain receiving the, 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 the TMS response is response, but the rest of the brain does seem not to respond. And this is repeated other for anesthesia and for uh, unresponsive wakefulness patients. Although in minimally conscious uh, patients, some of this propagation seems to be restored. So uh, this is very exciting. Uh, it's a great idea and, and it, it has served to, to develop, for example, the measure of a uh, perturbation complexity index. Um, but here we wanted to go further in the in the analysis of why and how uh, 
the propagation is disrupted. And to do so, um, in a nutshell, we studied resting state functional uh, MRI data from a cohort of healthy controls and two groups of patients, one in unresponsive wakefulness syndrome and the other ones in minimally conscious state. So in a nutshell, what we do is we will compute effective connectivity for all the patients. We will estimate that and we will do some network analysis of that uh, of that um, network connectivity. Uh, again, as mentioned, we are focusing in, in these stages, uh, patients that have been for a long term in both uh, stages. Um, now, usually uh, the concept of structural connectivity and functional connectivity is more repeated over the literature. The concept of effective connectivity is a bit more uh, mystical and, uh, and less common. So I would like to give a, just a little in, uh, in, uh, explanation in, intuitively what does effective connectivity do and how it is estimated. Usually when we have observations, signals like uh, resting state fMRI, uh, we try to build models to simulate that kind of activity. Now, no, our simulated signals initially don't look like uh, the observation of observed ones. So in order to make the properties of the simulation uh, closer to the observation, uh, we need to adjust some parameters. Right. In the case of effective connectivity, the parameters that are being uh, fitted are indeed the connections, the connection strengths of the connectivity matrix. So at the end of the process, we reach to some distribution of weights that lead to signals that are quite similar or have quite similar uh, statistics than the observed ones. Uh, so uh, effective connectivity estimation is model-based. So you need to assume a model. And once you have a model under the scope of that model, effective connectivity is the most likely connectivity pattern leading to the observed signals. In our case, we choose uh, a simple linear model, that, uh, which is the multivariate orsten um, which has been very often used uh, in, the, in the literature uh, of neuroscience uh, in order to account for the correlations between different brain regions. Um, now, once we have estimated effective connectivity for every subject, we want to do the network analysis. Typically, what you will read in the literature is that, well, since now here we have a weighted and directed uh, network, uh, in order to do graph analysis, uh, we will binarize that network uh, and then apply graph metrics uh, to this to this matrix. This is not what we're going to do here. Um, what we are going to try here is to uh, apply a novel method that we are developing to uh, study complex networks that is based on the propagation of activity. The idea is very simple. So imagine you have any net, a network with the adjacency matrix of the network. And we provide a perturbation, a small perturbation in every node. Because of this initial perturbation, uh, it will, this, this perturbation will propagate to other nodes and it will influence other nodes. So initially you have the patterns of influence, let's say, of, of the, or the responses of, uh, initially you have the, the, the perturbations given at each node. And over time, you will see uh, how these perturbations shape. And the main idea is that instead of studying the network from the adjacency matrix, we will extract information of the network from this spatial temporal uh, evolution. So network metrics now become spatial, spatial temporal properties of the responses. Um, now let's go to, 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 
to uh, the observations after applying this framework, the first thing was to calculate the effective connectivity matrices for all the subsets, right? So here we have some sample uh, effective connectivity matrices that we obtained. And something we observed in the beginning that was quite striking to us is the average value, so the average strength of the connections in the unresponsive wakefulness patients is seems to be larger than in the controls or in the minimally conscious state. Okay, that was a bit strange. And we're thinking, hmm, why could this happen? Um, so we look further at the individual links, what happens on the individual connections, and then we see that hmm, in the minimally conscious patients, uh, most of the so some links are significantly suppressed effective links but in the responsive uh, patients some of the links are suppressed but others are enhanced and looking a bit closer to this we realized that most of the not all but most of the connections that were enhanced in the in the unresponsive case are uh, connections between the cortical and, and the subcortical regions and those that are suppressed are between posterior and the frontal and mid posterior and the mid frontal. And in the, in the minimally uh, conscious patients, what basically gets suppressed is the default model network. Um, now, once we have this the, uh, effective, effective connectivity matrices, uh, we go ahead with the network analysis. So again, we apply a perturbation in each node. And what you see here are the spatial te the evolution of the spatial temporal responses. So as you see, at early times, the, the responses follow more or less the, the effective connectivities. But as the time goes, these uh, initial patterns uh, disperse. Um, there is plenty of information here that one can uh, analyze. So one has to go slowly, step by step. Um, the very first thing we can check is simplest. The, the, the simplest thing is to take the total weight. So the total response is some the total the average of these values, and we see how it evolves for the whole network. So we do this for the healthy controls, for the unresponsive, and the, for the minimally conscious. Now. This is what we obtain. And as you see in the black line is the average response uh, for the healthy controls. So after the perturbations, there is an increase in the, in, the, in, the, in the overall response, which slowly decays over time. Something similar happens for the minimally conscious patients. Uh, but look at what happens in the in the unresponsive patients, the red curve. So remember I said we had these links that were enhanced, no? but it seems that the effect of those links is that only the initial response is stronger. But despite this initial peak, the activity or, or their responses do not later propagate as well as they do in the uh, healthy and in, and, the, and in the minimally conscious uh, patients. Uh, and if you remember, this is uh, somehow what was uh, what, what I said in the beginning that the response for to, na to natural and to artificial stimuli, uh, the, the regions receiving the stimuli react, but somehow this, this information is not propagated and well, we are capturing that behavior in here. Now, something else we can do uh, is to now study because the effective connectivity is directed. So it gives us the chance to study what happens to the broadcasting and integration capacities of every individual region. So um, say, what happens when we excite one node and how does this node affect the rest of the of the network or the other way around how sensitive is a given region to perturbations all over 
the, the network. Um, by doing this analysis, uh, we found that in the healthy subjects, um, there is some regions which are uh, um, have a, a higher capacity for broadcasting or for receiving than, than others. Some of them, like here in the occipital regions, they are both uh, uh, high, strong at broadcasting and at receiving, but other lateral regions, for example, like here, um, we see a strong broadcasting, but we don't see uh, strong receiving capacities. In the unresponsive patients, uh, well, because the activity doesn't really propagate, we didn't see any specific, re any specific region that will stand out from the others. Uh, well, with the exception of the thalamus, but it's pretty obvious case. Um, what happens in the happened in the minimally conscious patients is that some of these patterns for broadcasting and receiving were seem to be restored. So, in summary, we found that strong broadcasting uh, seems to be happening at the temporal, frontoparietal, occipital, and parahippocampal para regions, and the strong receiving capacity, which is something needed for 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 integration happens at the PCC, the precuneus, uh, in inferior parietal regions, and at the thalamus. And some of these regions, as I said, uh, are recovered, are restored uh, in the in the minimally conscious patients. So, just as a summary, uh, I will mention that we were able to characterize the disruption of propagation in DOC patients following a model-based flow analysis. But in general, every patient is, of course, different. And the next challenge is, of course, to study what happens at the individual patients. But in general, we find that uh, the posterior cortex fails to convey information that is needed for integration, while the reduced broadcasting uh, happens at the subcortical, temporal, parietal, and frontal areas. And uh, so here you have some references. Um, the software you may need to reproduce uh, or to uh, these results or, or to apply this, to these methods um, with your data. And thank you all for your attention and especially the participants, the patients, and the families. Um, so after this, we will move now to uh, our third presentation. Please, Raya, uh, share your screen. The third presentation today will be by Rayanikan Panda. Uh, Rayanikan studied biomedical engineering and applied electronics at the Anna University of India in Chennai. Uh, then, after graduating, he worked for a few years as a research assistant and uh, at, uh, at, at, a, at a hospital as a research assistant. And well, after some time, he decided he needed, he wanted to move ahead and learn more. So he moved to the uh, Coma Science Group in Liege to, to pursue his uh, PhD, which he actually finished uh, basically six months ago. So Raya, please, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gurka, for your nice introduction. Uh, as uh, Olivia mentioned and uh, Gurka too, that uh, in uh, loss of consciousness uh, in a DOC patient, uh, the brain function and the structure massively loss. Uh, and to characterize the mechanism of consciousness, uh, we need to understand the underlying neural structure of this uh, uh, massive demands of function and structure. One way is to look the spatiotemporal causal properties of functional network or brain region and how the um, functional uh, network have a link with anatomical uh, connections. Uh, further, as uh, Olivia 
is uh, uh, highlighted that uh, integrated level of description is needed uh, combining with theory and data driven approach indeed from last decade there have been many conscious theory uh, which uh, explore the consciousness however it still lacks uh, the empirical evidence in disorder of consciousness to explain um, with respect to the conscious theory so, uh, brain uh, uh, function can be understand from connectivity through static or dynamic functional connectivity the uh, connectivity uh, we can look through structural uh, white matter fiber connections or through uh, functional uh, statistical uh, correlation between two regions so uh, in the uh, left side you could see the functional connectivity between regions and uh, to uh, explain more fine grained uh, characteristics of this uh, structural and functional connectivity one way is to understand the spatial temporal pattern and you could see in the right side the uh, this is the dynamic functional connectivity matrix and connections which change across time so our brain have a uh, different uh, functional state which uh, occur or which uh, appear and reappear across time and indeed in the uh, many studies have been shown that uh, in our brain uh, uh, some network have a higher association with the uh, conscious process and it the connectivity and activity get lost in uh, loss of consciousness it's also been shown that the dynamic uh, connectivity pattern uh, also altered specifically the brain uh, which have a um, complex long, long range connections it reduces in uws patient whereas the simpler uh, connections get increases our data also been shown that the uh, functional connectivity matrices uh, in uws patient have a higher correlation with the structural connectivity matrices so it brings the question how this uh, uh, resting state functional network uh, get altered spatially and uh, temporally and how it have the link with the anatomical connections uh, there could be some network which spatial uh, uh, distribution could be increased or getting lost that is our um, aim to characterize so uh, i'm i'll be uh, presenting one of our recent work where we looked uh, the brain structural functional uh, connections um, uh, and how the uh, meta stability it's uh, um, getting altered in patient with doc and how the functional uh, uh subcortical cortical network repertoire get altered in this context this work uh, have been done in the hbp framework in collaboration with amsterdam umc and upf barcelona in this study we have uh, uh, selected uh, doc patient with 14 uws 30 mcs patient and 34 healthy control and we have taken structural mri and resting state functional mri this data is there in the e brain the functional uh, uh, matrices please uh, feel free to look at so the goal is to understand the functional network repertoire in doc for which we have used non negative tensor factorization and meta stability approach so first what uh, we extracted uh, the dynamic functional connectivity uh, matrices uh, um, from uh, uh, taking the phase uh, um, interaction at each time point then this dynamic functional connectivity matrices uh, have used along with the a priori uh, uh, functional network to non negative tensor factorization algorithm this non negative tensor factorization algorithm allow us to uh, characterize the functional network spatial distribution and how this functional network brain states have uh, differ with temporally in different uh, state uh, that is in the uh, unconscious state or in the conscious state we mainly uh, uh, characterize the temporal uh, uh, aspect of this functional state uh, in uh, dual time and excursion the dual time is uh, 
represent how a brain state is active across time or in the other uh, term you know, the time spent a network actively across time whereas in excursion uh, it represent how the network uh, non stationarity present um, uh, across the time further we also looked uh, the brain uh, functional repertoire using meta stability which is uh, represent the variance of uh, whole brain synchronization um, by computing the standard deviation of kurumoto parameter then to understand how the uh, uh, functional uh, repertoire have the link with the structural uh, network we looked the dti and uh, eigen mode approach the eigen mode approach is basically uh, extract the uh, harmonic uh, structural network component and what we did uh, we correlate this uh, structural network component with uh, dynamic functional connectivity matrices using the fitting which allow us to uh, uh, study how uh, the uh, uh, functional repertoire can explain underlying net, uh, structural network properties so through this uh, approach uh, what you find uh, the uh, spatial pattern of uh, uh, um, uh, functional networks and the non negative tensor factorization uh, um, given uh, the spatial distribution and we noted that uh, and they have a classical uh, functional network such as dmn visual salience posterior dmn frontoparietal and the subcortical which comes along with the frontoparietal and temporal region to be noted uh, uh, as a a priori we use the subcortical regions there is the thalamus caudate putamen uh, and it uh, the mm, non negative tensor factorization provide that it have a strong association with the frontal parietal and temporal region then to uh, characterize how this brain uh, functional network states are uh, uh, distributed in uh, unconscious and conscious state we look their temporal properties that is the dual time which represent how much each uh, brain state it's uh, active across time and excursion we find the dual time is uh, uh, different or have a reduced in uh, some network that is posterior dmn frontoparietal and uh, subcortical with frontoparietal temporal network whereas uh, the non stationarity shows uh, there have re reduced in all functional network specifically uh, the default mode network which did not show, show the dual uh, time differences uh, but there have a differences between the uh, doc patient and healthy control as well as between the uh, doc patient as the uws with mcs another factor which we noted that uh, the uh, subcortical um, network which comes with the you know, frontoparietal temporal network that have a significant differences in both dual time and excursion this indicate that this uh, uh, network is uh, higher association with the loss of consciousness or in the recovery process uh, our finding is goes in line with the uh, different conscious theory such as the global neuronal uh, workspace theory which uh, postulate that um, the long range connections uh, and uh, the uh, uh, sensory uh, visual uh, uh, information carries with the uh, uh, multiple brain region uh, through uh, frontal parietal and temporal region and here we see that um, uh, subcortical regions uh, have a higher association with the frontoparietal and temporal region the broad uh, region of cortical areas and their um, temporal both dual time and excursion is reduces and so uh, our finding also in line to the micro uh, major circuit hypothesis and internal external network that uh, says that the uh, internal network which uh, shows uh, uh, the default mode network have a loss of uh, stationarity whereas the frontoparietal network have the 
association both uh, with the uh, subcortical area and it have the uh, temporal um, disruption. Then further looking the uh, how it, you know, the functional network repertoire is linked to the structure, we look the eigen mode and uh, we find the eigen mode which represent how much harmony is there between the functional repertoire and uh, structural network. We found uh, the harmony is less in UWS patient compared to healthy control. And when we look the um, further, we looked when with the stability, uh, the metastability, which represent how the brain uh, um, uh, uh, states are uh, uh, synchronized, we find the uh, uh, subject who have a lower metastability, they have a lower eigen mode. So this uh, uh, indicates that uh, the brain uh, functional repertoire when it is lost, it's also uh, have a lower with the uh, structural functional uh, harmony. As a summary, we also uh, shown that the, uh, in loss of consciousness, uh, there have a breakdown in subcortical, frontoparietal and temporal repertoire. One uh, uh, main entity which we lack in this study is the cause, uh, causal interaction and uh, structural property, which uh, Gorka have shown. And uh, through uh, computational modeling, we can further characterize this uh, spatiotemporal uh, properties uh, in terms of causal interaction. Thank you. And sorry for the uh, technical disturbance. Okay, thank you, Roya, very much for the for the presentation. Uh, so we are now moving to the question and answer uh, uh, session. Uh, well, uh, I will start quickly. There is a question for uh, Olivia, but it's a few ones. Let me see. Uh, so I would say, uh, Olivia, thank you for your exciting talk. I wonder what is the PCI output when psychedelics are applied to healthy controls? Have you observed any increase or decrease pattern? So we haven't uh, checked that ourselves yet, but there is preliminary evidence that using psychedelic, you can have a slight increase of PCI. And that's the work of our colleague in Oslo, uh, the group of um, Johan Storm and colleagues on rodent, um, and also on healthy participant, actually. Uh, however, I have to highlight that PCI has been developed to really disentangle consciousness from unconsciousness. So in conscious patients, we are not expecting to have a very big difference. And so there was another question regarding this for someone who meditates and has uh, maybe uh, delta waves. Uh, again, here meditation, we know that the patient is conscious, so we are not expecting a very big increase. And in one of our expert meditator, we actually didn't see a much uh, increase with PCI. Uh, if we see here Delta, however, I would even expect something uh, lower in that case. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so there was another question. Uh, okay. So I guess myself. we would also use other measure of brain complexity, such as LFBLZIV or um, many other entropy measures. So it's not specifically to PCI. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, well, there was a question about the, 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 the effective connectivity. So I will read to Gorka Zamora. Um, is this increase in initial responsiveness to perturbations for the unresponsive wakefulness patients indicative of a possible response mechanism to regions try and reestablish the lost connections? or perhaps to an indication of an increased activity to those regions due to loss of inhibitory connections to them. None of them, both. Um, it could be both. Um, it is, yeah, it is a bit unclear yet um, to us what is exactly happening. And I think we need to look closer with um, other techniques, but, um, yeah, I remember there was some old uh, older um, uh, ideas of of epilepsy, you know, like that that 
the, the connection between regions was was, dis, uh, was was disrupted, and then some regions were trying to push and push and push the the, the, the communication. Um, it could go in the same direction, but again, it will also be as as, as you point um, a reason of an imbalance of the excitatory inhibitory uh, connections within the regions that. Uh, leads to a less inhibition and therefore just uh, more activity, specifically in one region, but then the connections are not working and this increased activity is not being followed. Um, so, uh, uh, let's see. Um, ah, okay. There was here uh, another question for Olivia. So, um, Olivia, what is the difference between minimally conscious and recovered state? These are responsive patients which show complex behavior. Were they, were they aware when they came around of what was happening during the time they were still unresponsive? Mm -hmm. Um, so minimally conscious patients, we cannot communicate with them. It's impossible to interact uh, verbally or with gesture uh, in a functional way, effective way. Whereas if they recover, that's when we said, okay, now we can actually ask a question and have a yes or no answer and it's accurate. So that's the difference. One, we can functionally communicate and the other one not. Or, function, or they can also use function uh, object like a cup or cum. And to respond to the second question, um, so far we have not had any patients who were unresponsive and then recovered remembering the session uh, after TMSEG, but it's also not uncommon because we know that patients after severe brain injury, they have amnesia. So even if you uh, go see a patient in a rehabilitation center, you see them for a week nonstop, and then you come back three months later when they recover, they don't remember you. So, so yeah, so, so far we haven't had anyone who remember being in that state uh, when the um, uh, experiment in the session happened. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, there is actually a question for the three of us actually. Um, it is first uh, addressed for Olivia, but uh, it says, what is your, your opinion on intrinsic ontology within integrated information theory, IIT, by uh, Julia Tonani? Mia, I have no answer to that question. Okay. I have to speak more into the IIT, so I let you respond. So, Raya, you want to... Camp on the. We have uh, one more minute, so yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, for me also it's a quite uh, uh, complicated question to answer, and I think to uh, uh, understand with respect to the order of consciousness is uh, and IIT there is uh, still uh, study need to be uh, uh, done, but. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, um, network responses, which you saw, that uh, characteristic of information integration, or uh, on the study which we have done on ignition, which uh, shows how much uh, the integration happen in the brain, uh, in spatially and temporally, it shows that in loss of consciousness, the um, uh, integration with respect to empirical uh, measure uh, get reduces. So they have a, a link uh, to uh, the IIT and what we observe in empirically in uh, DOC patient, but still um, there is a lot to understand or to see uh, using different um, uh, mathematical modalities and uh, recent advances on uh, methods. Okay, yeah, thank you, Raya. Um, yeah, just super, very, very briefly, uh, the, the results, uh, we showed uh, for the propagation analysis actually indicate that uh, there are some aspects of uh, different theories that could be widely validated. It doesn't mean that uh, they are exclusively uh, 
um, correct or wrong. It's simply that maybe different theories uh, are looking at different aspects of the same problem. Uh, and with that, I'm afraid that we are running out of time. Uh, I want to thank you uh, all for attending this, this webinar. Uh, if you wanted to see the, the replay, please join the Human Brain Project YouTube channel. If you have questions, please contact us uh, at outreachhumanbrainproject.eu. Uh, the next webinar will be on February 14th on the topic of HPP scientists propose guidelines for describing network connectivity. Thank you all for your participation and I wish you all a good day and a good evening.